Sippers, welcome to the Tea With Me podcast. I'm Shane Todd. For the first time at the start of a podcast, I am tealess. The reason that I am tealess is because you guys know I'm a heavy tea drinker. Uh, some people say I have a problem. Um, some cruel people would say the problem is with my ears because I, I actually have pretty big ears, but it's hard to tell just because of the way my hair sits and it was worse whenever I was younger and I used to get teased a lot for that. And I appreciate you didn't bring that up, but a lot of people would say, man, you drink a lot of tea and I do drink a lot of tea, but I've recorded three podcast episodes this afternoon and I've drunk seven cups of tea. So what I'm going to do is ease off for the intro, okay? In the actual episode that I'm about to do right now, I am drinking legitimate tea. But for now, let me just take a second to dry out because, man, I'm jonesing for a cup of tea. There's about 58 things I do for a cup of tea right now. And a lot of them involve middle-aged guys. So what I'm going to do is introduce this episode. My guest today is Liam McCourt. Liam McCourt is an MMA fighter from Belfast. Leah, I guess I became aware of about four years ago or so. When um, there was quite a bit of press about her coming up as a fighter. And um, people were saying like, oh, she's she's going to go to the top. And sort of followed her career since then um, with a keen eye. And she's absolutely killing it at the minute. She just headlined. Uh, Bellator in in Dublin at the uh, at the three arena in Dublin, which is massive. Bellator and UFC are the main sort of fight companies. Also, I've called them fight companies. There's probably legitimate fight fans being like, they're not called companies, mate. They're called divisions. I don't know a lot about fighting. This interview is not strictly for people that are just in the MMA or competitive fighting, uh, because I'm not like a total aficionado about it as you'll see. Um, It's just an interesting chat. Leah is very, very interesting to listen to, to hear about sort of her journey and how she approaches fights, all that kind of thing. And I guess we talked a bit about just being a fighter as a job, because a bit like stand-up, it's not a normal job, you know, and, and, and people have their own perceptions of that, so I wanted to pick her brain a wee bit about that as well. And she's just properly funny. Um, There's a particular story where she talks about uh, going out to fight in Belgium, that tickled me pink. So, hope you guys enjoy this interview. Um, what we're going to do is keep doing what we're doing. Wednesday episodes of this, Friday episodes, the Patreon episode on a Monday. That's patreon.com slash tea with me podcast if you want to support the podcast and get the bonus episode every week. And we've got loads more stuff on there. Patreon.com slash tea with me podcast. Hope you're going to enjoy this episode. It's a Liam McCord episode of the tea with me podcast. Lee, the first question I ask everybody is, do you drink tea? This podcast is called Tea With Me. I'm an avid, avid tea drinker. Um, but what's your, what's your sort of tea background? Yeah, I'm a big tea drinker. I have about five cups a day. And I try my best not to have biscuits, but I always, always end up eating biscuits. I mean, it's hard to know if five cups a day is, is a lot or, or not that much because I, I mean I've known people on occasion to go maybe like 11 12 I don't know I, wow I, I'd sort of like I wouldn't enjoy totting up how many a day I have I reckon I'm somewhere about the seven or eight mark but do that's a genuine question right I don't know anything about like nutrition or anything in terms of like like fight. <laughs> but is tea like something you have to like are you allowed to drink as much tea as you want when you're preparing for a fight not really no not really so hopefully my nutritionist doesn't listen to this because every time I have tea I have a a little bit of milk in it and you're not meant to have milk and I always like probably the heart the reason why I don't make weight as easy as I should is because I have tea and biscuits it's like my yeah biggest downfall I mean that's probably (laughs) hearing that from you is probably why I'll never go into mixed martial arts you know because I've been thinking about it for a while but (laughs) if I can't drink tea when I'm training (laughs) It's a, it's a, I don't think I'm going to pursue it as a career because a lot of people were saying to me, like, I'm built, I'm built for it. Like I would, a lot of people would say. Yeah. I went to one jujitsu class about two years ago and then um, halfway through it, uh, it was in uh, Valley Leisure Center in Newton Abbey. And halfway through it, I was like, God, this is, this is actually pretty good. Like I'm getting on okay here. And it was like a advanced course. And then I realized that everybody was kind of like nodding at each other before I rolled with them, you know, they were like, you know, let this guy kind of... better. Yeah, it was, it was an eye-opening experience. Um, so what's your, what's your like lockdown situation then? What, um, how does your job, how does, how does lockdown impact what, what you do? So normally I live in, I live in Belfast, well, I live in St. Fields and I, I train in Dublin 
and I normally I usually get up leaving my daughter to school and drive to Dublin to train so obviously I can't do that now I'm training in my house I have a kitchen in my or, or a treadmill in my kitchen and I have a garage that has like a punch bag skipping like I'm just like kind of doing my own training camp like rocky style it's quite interesting and different I actually quite like it yeah, I mean, skipping is something I would have been like, a big fan of in primary school. I was like quite the skipper. You know, even when like the girls had like the double rope thing, I would have always got involved. But I thought I was a good skipper. Like I decided to take skipping up again about six months ago. And I thought like, God, I'm good at this. And I was doing it like in the gym in front of people. And then one day I caught a reflection of myself skipping and I went, I'm done. I'm done skipping. Because it was just... It was I would never... Like, even I would never skip in front of somebody else. Like, it is, like, people watch when people skip, and I'm like, no, it's too it's, nerve-wracking. <laughs> it's, weirdly, it's weirdly confident, isn't it? Someone that's just, like, skipping in front of you, just fully going for it. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've stopped skipping. <laughs> the, the idea of this podcast is kind of just, like, laid-back chat. I'd say you do a lot of press, especially around a fight, and you must get asked, like, the same questions all the time. What's the number one question? Yeah. What's the number one question you get asked that you're just sick of, sick of answering? Um, probably how did you get into MMA or what this sounds really bad but what's it like being a female role model or like inspiring other girls like I just want to rip my eyeballs out I'm like I don't I get I get asked that a lot too I get asked that a lot too but yeah I mean that that must be a, a lot of times when you do interviews a lot of it must be geared to oh so you're like a female fighter that must be annoying to to, to kind of yes, have so instead of just like instead of being being a fighter i i've started the lie in press interviews now like anytime i'm promoting a tour i find like to keep it interesting for myself i'm dropping in like a, a lie here or there but do you <laughs> do you feel like is, is it do you not find it difficult not to answer with the same answers all the time and then that or be cheeky yeah like I, when you're cutting weight and you're you can't even you're so in such a bad mood. Like I go into my trainers and I'm so cheeky and so rude, but they know I'm cutting weight. I'm starving. I'm so pissed off. I've got so much pressure. I've got a fight coming up. And like there's so much on me. And like I remember one time for the last fight, this guy from some big new agents was like, So can you describe what MMA is? And I said, Could you not Google that? And then I like, caught myself on and was like, Whoa. <laughs> I find it really hard to, to like to myself I was like a lot so cheeky and then he was like um said something about some like generic question and I was like actually put my hand in my head and I was like looking at my friends and they had to like jump in before I was even got even worse so around fight week and fight time I'm particularly bad but I I think people kind of like that in a way as well especially with like with fighters of all kinds um where, where you just have your own personality and you don't just robotically yeah. answer, answer, answer all the same questions I think you have to have a bit of personality and is that that's something i want to ask you like i'm i'm like a complete armchair viewer of um of like ufc and boxing like i don't know i don't know a lot about it i think i went to a boxing class once whenever i was about nine and then never went back because i realized that <laughs> i realized that people hit you back um and and i just didn't want that but but is so how so to me right um fighters have to now maybe not come up with a character but you have to kind of look at the other side of things not just fighting in terms of like being a brand yeah do, do, do you just do all that yourself do you work all that out yourself or do you have someone going look maybe like you could you could do this or that so how how, how no not really do you know i understand what you're saying some some fighters take on a persona and, and like to, to be to make it in MMA or to make it in boxing you have to be interested you have to make people want to watch you do you know and I'm lucky I have like obviously unique standpoints I'm a, a female and a mum and I'm not your stereotypical fighter which is allows me to just be myself and be just be normal but I do see the way when guys have to kind of act like you know this and that to try and sell the fights and like I that, that's fine they do that but I just don't have time for that I'm just like uh, just tr just try and be myself how cringy that sounds yeah but I do understand what you mean see being I don't because I mean for some reason it took me nine minutes to to say that question um but <laughs> I think I think what I was saying is yeah basically like are, are, are you in charge of your own like trajectory if that makes sense like do you yeah or do you have someone doing that for you 
No, I, it's like, and I'm one of the few fighters that actually manage myself. Like I negotiate my own contracts and do all my own sponsors. And like, I look after everything myself because I always think nobody can do a better job than me. And I'm, it's quite arrogant of me, but I just don't like leaving my stuff in the hands of other people. And I think that's got me some quite good opportunities because like promoters and stuff respect that. I, you can just deal with me directly rather than having to go through some manager. Um, but no, I just do it all myself. But I do have some friends, like my friends aren't like yes men. They're completely ruthless and so, so hard on me. And they're like, like they bring me back to the earth with a bang. So I can never really be anything else but me. I wish I had that attitude. I, I like yes men as friends. Like after every gig, I'm like, guys, that was good, wasn't it? And they go, yeah, it was <laughs> great. I mean, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm all about. But no, I know what you mean. I think you have to have people around you that will, will kind of like, te- you know, tell you the way it is. Um, in terms of of being a be, being a mom living in Saint Field, I I get really conscious that when my neighbours sort of see me during the day, and maybe like I've got camera equipment and I'm coming out at weird times, I always go, I wonder, do they know what I do, or or do they <laughs> do they think they know what my job is? Do you do you get that? Where like, I don't know. Do you, do you ever feel like um? when when you sort of meet people or whatever that they'll be surprised almost at what you do and and or think people are really fascinated when you when you say because you must meet like say like your daughter's school for example if if maybe you got chatting to other parents or whatever <laughs> and you say like i'm a fu- i'm a full-time fighter what's what's the reaction whenever whenever you say that yeah i don't because i think they all kind of know now but i do get looks and like obviously whenever i'm fighting i always get like i'm like get my hair and makeup done but I go to school run like any other mom like was looking like a, I don't know what like flip flops on tracks at bottoms hair wraps, mess, like, wraps look, in I'm, your hand like <laughs> hair got hair going on yeah. I look horrendous all day every day and turn up to do the school run but yeah no people stop me all like at the time and so awkward when they say oh I see you're fighting Saturday and it's like yeah and like you don't know what to say back it's like oh okay Cool. What's, what's <laughs> like they want they wanted to converse with you and I'm like I don't know what you want me to say back like thanks so much well I was gonna say like the number being a comedian the number one thing people say when they know you're a comedian is tell me a joke so I don't know if people yeah. say to you, here jab me <laughs> uh, no the, the number one question is when's your next fight it's like I literally fought on Saturday night I don't know when my next fight is <laughs> can, can, pe- can people be dicks about it as well like will you get like like I expect like I expect people like, I don't know. I think the number one thing, if 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 a guy, if if I was to meet a fighter, I would want to ask him like all about all about fighting and that kind of thing. But or, yeah, or, or, have you ever had people like like? I just imagine some fellas could be just just dickheads. So have you ever had a fellow be like, drink? You, could you take me like that? Kind, do you ever get? Oh that? my god! Like. So if I, like, I don't drink and I don't really go out. And when I do go out in Belfast, I don't, if anybody asks what I do, I don't never tell them. Like, I would never say. And I, what do you if say? anybody, and if, and I'm just, I'm a coach. And they're like, what, what are you coaching? Like, sport? Or like, <laughs> and, if, any, if any, if me, yeah, no, if any, so, so the conversation can't keep going. I'm, but I'm, I don't, I'm not really like socializing. Or if my friends are with me and if any of them say what I do, I literally hit them under the table. I'm like, shut don't like and it just because it just is like an avalanche of these questions that are so annoying it's just like never ending topic <laughs> do you get like what 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 about online you know do you get uh, do you get like do you get many like weird messages do you get like you know, the like i can't even describe my outbox on instagram it's like never one normal person it's always like <laughs> definitely in some sort of sex offender list they're definitely like in prison or they're, like they have they're like single dads with like 10 kids that message me and I'm like and they send videos and I never watch them and the, they send voice messages like what are what are the voice messages say yeah it's I mean crazy voice messages I feel like should be should be banned I don't know why anybody's leaving voice notes there they, they should be left in the past but yeah I mean that must <laughs> that must be weird just having a fella be like listen when I get out of my gallery you and me should spar <laughs> literally all the time and then it's like what I do is I can't I can't make them in a normal day so so in fight week when we're in the fighters hotel and there's nothing to do and we're all sitting around that's when we go through my outbox so we're like to keep the spirits high and like one of them like oh so crazy this guy was like this guy was like driving and he was like looking at the camera being like Leah 
and like, like he kept like glancing to the camera and like saying these weird things and I was and I screen recorded it and I didn't realize he could see that I screen recorded uh, it yes. and I was and he was like um screen record question mark I was like sorry just wanted to replay that while I was cutting weight to keep us all laughing <laughs> like can't even describe the amount of messages and they're so insane like crazy yeah like can I have a picture of your feet for 50 uh. quid like for 50, yeah, okay. 50, 50 <laughs> quid, I mean, listen, I, I don't have much work on at the minute. Reply to that guy, give him my email address because if he wants pitch, I have size 11 feet. I feel like there's a lot there's a lot to go into a picture there. So, uh, Whoa, yeah. yeah. The weird thing is I have I have like like long feet. I have like narrow, long feet. And uh, I'm like pretty tall now, but whenever I was younger, before I had a growth spurt, I was like always like the smallest in my year at school. But I have had these big feet since like i don't know 2002 so my problem <laughs> was it was kind of like as 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 long out the ways as i was up you know i was like a, a letter l because i always like my my feet were kind of they didn't match up my body like i was i was i was size 11 <laughs> but it was five two so i'm i'm sort of like more in proportion now which is which is good I, i'm gonna okay, ask you a question that. no worries i'm gonna ask you a question that <laughs> Because I don't think people would think I had size 11 feet. I, I'd say a lot of people would guess like <laughs> eight, eight at most. But deceptively, I have very long feet. Are you but selling yourself here? <laughs> I'm selling myself to this fella. If he's doing 50 quid a time, I mean, I'll send him way more than pictures of the feet <laughs> for 50 quid. <laughs> he could get the heap. But no, I want to ask a question that I'd say like a lot of, uh, a lot of people ask, especially fellas. Like, say me and you were to fight, say say it was like some sort of charity fight and we were like really going for it. How quickly could you knock me out? Would we be talking like two, three seconds? Um, so my, my background is like grappling, like submissions, like putting people to sleep. So I would say probably a minute, max. If I, if I could last a minute, I'd be delighted. Although I am quite like slippery, you know, like, yeah. I feel like if you're trying to, you, if you're trying to tie me up. Fight. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'd be. I just be like, oh, I'm all right. <laughs> fight. I mean, I I, rem, I remember seeing a seeing a boxing match for the first time. Uh, that was that was the first form of fighting that I that I'd ever seen like live. And before that, like I'd always thought about doing like white collar boxing. You know, I was like, yeah, that'd be a bit of me. Good way to like get fit. And um, anytime you watch white collar boxing, it's the most. Awful. It's just like it's insane. But do, do you think people go, say, say someone like me was going to try that, you could, you could spar and you could feel like you were maybe getting some sort of technique. Do you think people, when they hear that first bell, it just all goes out the oh, way? Oh, 100%. 100%. Still, still, still with me, when you, you've got this game plan in your head and you're like, no, I'm going to do this, I'm going to step back, I'm going to look for shots. And that bell goes, you're like, and that cage door closes, you're fighting for your life. It's like, and like you see them just going insane. Like they're... Like their uh, output levels is just crazy. It's just like whoever landed dig first wins. And it was white color boxing fight. It's so funny. So yeah, you're... Sorry, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. All right. I'm no, just gonna say you're like your instinct <laughs> just like <laughs> shoots in and you just go crazy. Yeah, I mean sometimes I'd be keen to know about whenever you're actually in a fight, right? So whenever I'm on stage doing stand up, it's it's adrenaline, but probably not like it's more spread out because I'm maybe up there for an Do you hour get or whatever. Um, yeah, but in a, diff- a different way than when I used to. And I, I know the feelings of nerves now, so I'm able to yeah. almost like enjoy it. Like if I get nervous, yeah. it's like giddy nerves. And once I get the first laugh, it's maybe it's maybe like throwing the first, connecting with the first punch. Once you get the first yeah. laugh, I go, okay, and I, I know where I'm at. But whenever I'm doing stand-up, I, I can almost talk to myself in while I'm talking on stage. I can like have a dialogue with myself and be like, okay, maybe I should do this bit next to whatever. When you're having a fight, is it just like adrenaline and go for it? Or are you, are, are, are you like having a conversation almost with yourself during it? Um, in MMA, because it's so, like you can lose so many different ways, you can win so many different ways. Yeah, you de- it, it's definitely a lot of it is you're just natural, you're training your skills and your, your transitions from one move to the next or one thing to the next. But a lot of it is I listen to my, my coaches in the corner as well. So um, listen to the, their advice and once more, you, more so you have a game plan and then but t- when exhaustion and fatigue kicks in, that's when you're, you're listening to your coaches and listening to your, their direction. But you do have to have a kind of killer instinct and know when to... Uh, go and when to not when to kind of conserve your energy 
So chat to me about how, you, I know the number one question you get is how you got into MMA and that kind of thing, but what was the, what was the like moment where you went, even as a hobby, you, I'm, I'm going to get into this? So I was like always a psychopath competitive, like on every sports team. I went to methadone, was on like captain of the chess team, like horse riding, basketball, hockey, always loved just competing in anything. It's and not a path I, I don't think many people would follow, be like, listen, captain of the chess team, professional <laughs> MMA fighter. It's not the, no, it's not the normal I route. Know. But was it just that you wanted to Meth- win anything you did? Yeah, methodist scholar into the cage it's a bit different isn't it for methody yeah. <laughs> no I, so i did judo my, my dad had three daughters and he um he's from liverpool he's quite a intimidating big man he's like six foot six and he was like he always wanted us to know how to look after ourselves so he made we hated it so much we we had to go and do judo every thursday night when we were kids for years and years and i like um used to hate it so much. I used to do really well in competing the Northern Ireland team because I just went in and threw them straight away because I hated competing. I hated it. So then I, I always wanted to learn. I loved watching Bruce Lee movies. I loved going and watching the boxing with my granda and was always like fascinated by martial arts. I watched all the Olympics. And then after I had my daughter, I wanted to start to learn how to do kickboxing, like learn how to do the striking part of it because I loved all the different martial arts. It wasn't just one I liked watching. So when I started doing Muay Thai, it was like, that's kicking, punching elbows and knees. Um, I became obsessed and the guys were just kind of like threw me at the deep end. And I had my first MMA, because when they heard I had a background in grappling, it was like, I don't know if you like six months. It's like so not the thing to do, like go and take right. a fight. And it was like on a big show in like the Ulster Hall. It was like my, the first female fight in Belfast, in Northern Ireland. Like oh, wow. had no idea what I was doing. Went in and I won and like, a minute thank goodness because I, uh, like, I don't know what would have happened but um after having that first fight I just kind of went from there I just I loved watching it. I just was mesmerized by how hard the training was how technical you had to be how much went into it and how like the fight IQ how intelligent you had to be to fight in MMA because that's kind of like a misconception that an idiot with me would have like me would have I, I think if you if you do kickboxing or whatever then you can just do it all or if you do judo Surely you yeah. can do Muay Thai or I, 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 it's like only, only through watching a bit more like fighting and stuff do I realize, oh, they're just totally different things. It's maybe a bit like, maybe not as much, yeah. but it's a bit like going, if you play football, you can play rugby. If, you know, it's, exactly, a, it's, a different, yeah. it's a totally different discipline. And then the move from that being like a hobby or, or maybe something you were doing for fitness or, or whatever, what, what was the move from that to, you know, this is actually what, what you want to pursue? I think it was probably for my first fight. I didn't really know the extent of where I could go with it and nobody really went before me to, to make it a career to make to do the things that I've kind of went ahead and done. You know, I went to um after a couple of amateur fights over here, I went and did the um IMAF, it's the International Mixed Martial Arts, Mixed Martial Arts Federation, the kind of governing body there, European Championships and I won those. And I went to Vegas and won the uh, World Championships. We had like three fights in one week. It was an unbelievable experience. And so, so, so I see whenever you're doing that is, that, is that still in the back of your mind? Are you like, you know, this is just like a passion thing that I'm doing? Or whenever you're, you're in Vegas doing that, is that when you're like, oh, this is, this is what I do now? Sippers, let me really quickly interrupt the podcast with a quick charity message. We don't have sponsors at the minute. So what we're doing is giving a platform to a different charity or appeal every week. This time, there is a virtual dance party happening in people's living rooms in aid of our NHS heroes at the Causeway Hospital in Coleraine. Alan Simpson got in touch with me about this. Alan, uh, if, if you live around the North Coast, you know the North Coast, you'll know that Alan is Mr. Mr. Port Magic and he's heavily involved with the dance music scene. He got in touch with me about this and uh, I'll very quickly tell you a bit about it. Some of Northern Ireland's finest DJs will be joining forces, Sly I wasn't asked, to raise much needed funds for the NHS. We're planning to host the biggest house party via a live stream. The virus doesn't discriminate based on music taste and neither will we. There's going to be hip hop, funk, soul, indie, all that kind of stuff. Maybe even some country in the odd live band or two. The, the top DJs are playing for everyone in aid of our NHS heroes. The full lineup is going to be announced soon, but in the meantime, the confirmed people are JK, Gary Hassan, DJ Joanne, DJ Venus, uh, DJ Ash, Marty Rice, Niall Quinn, Typical One, Doc75. I mean, I'm enjoying all those names. And it's hosted by Mr. Port Magic himself, Alan Simpson. More DJs announced soon. All proceeds 
our native NHS Causeway Hospital Korean. That is on over consecutive Saturdays. I'll put all the info in the link below. If you have a charity message or an appeal, anything you think we should be mentioning on the podcast, get in touch with us. Tea with me podcast at gmail.com. Back to the pod. <laughs> Oh no, like completely, like you have to be completely, it's like you're getting accused of fighting with somebody, you have to be obsessed, you have to be totally disciplined, like it just takes over your whole life, it's just like you lose your mind in it, it's crazy, you just get so obsessed, and like but back then it's been my nerves, I li- literally remember lying in a hotel room being like what am I doing, like even backstage at fights now, I'm like what, why am I doing, why would I ever choose what I need to do this? Yeah, I know like, that I remember, I was like lying in the, um, me and all my, my team and my friends over from Liverpool, we were all in, my, in the hotel room beside the three arena like last month. And I, in the morning, I woke up and I was like, let's all go to Dublin Airport, get a flight to Flip and Barbados. Like, yeah. why would I willingly go in front of 10,000 people and fight another person in the cage? It's like, why would I do this? Yeah. And, and then, and, like, and, and obviously, it's televised and stuff as well. You know, the. the- yeah. Like, on America, American TV, TV over here, it's like you 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 could walk out and be someone's highlight reel finish, and that could be be played over and over again for the rest of your life. Or you could walk out and change your life. It's like every time you go into the cage, the outcome after you're never the same. There's a there's a massive change, like yeah. for the better or for the worse. You know, so it's it's so addictive. You can't even describe the feeling. It's it's funny you say about like just before a big one being like we could not do this the first time yeah. I did the Ulster Hall I went to buy like bottles of water for like the comedians that were on before me and some of the staff it shows you the level career wise I'm at where I, I I was I was walking down the Dublin <laughs> Road with a big crate of water but uh but yeah I went down there. I was like I, I like going for a walk before shows anyway so I was like I'll go for a walk by myself get a bit of air. And this was like two hours before the show and I was buying like a multi-pack of water. And I remember just thinking, I could just keep walking to the yeah. road here and just, just keep going. And nobody would know my phone was back at the venue. I was like, I, I, could, just, yeah. I could just go away and not do this. Yeah, it's like on fight day, I really take in, when I, if, say we're in Dublin or we're in a different country, I like look at other people, I'm like, Look, they're so relaxed. I could be, I could be them. I could be so relaxed right now and not be doing this. Like, like I've walked through the venue before and been like, I actually wish this bus would hit me down so I didn't have yeah. to go do this. Like, would a taxi just knock me down? I actually remember one time in Belgium, I was fighting on Cage Warriors, and like, the, there's no way to describe backstage in an MMA fight. You can smell fear. Everybody is just, it's just tension. It's like, it's like. Oh, I can't even describe it. It's so intense and people don't like coming backstage because it's just so, there's so much pressure and your, your friend's going out to fight and you can't control it. Yep. So we, we, we had arrived at the arena and um, the commentator came in and the referee, head referee, we did like a rules meeting and, the co- and every, it was just like it was smelly and warm and the commentator started to speak and he fainted. And in my head, I was going, please be dead if, if he's dead i don't have to fight please die like please god please don't wake up please don't wake up and then like he like woke up after like 10 minutes and i was like fuck see you guys like i'm gonna i'm gonna have to go fight now <laughs> and i keep telling people that story oh. and i've seen him i've seen him after i was like oh, <laughs> glad you didn't die <laughs> i mean it'd be so, he'd be so paranoid if you just kept saying that to him all night there just <laughs> I was saying, everyone, thank God you didn't. <laughs> I know. Oh. Yeah, although, see the way you say, like, you sit and watch people beforehand and think, like, I, I could be like them. The thing is, there's something, yeah. no matter what kind of performing you do or whatever, or, or you, when you're in a, a, a game, maybe comedy is similar, you, you, you can't be one of those people because I know there is this thing inside us where you, where, where you want to perform and you want to, like, put yourself under this mad pressure. I think there's less pressure obviously with stand-up because no one's no one's, I, I no one's trying to beat so, me up but i would no. like be like so nervous like if people weren't like i'd be like oh my god like you have to be so confident to get and do that do you know what you get used to it when people not do that <laughs> do people sometimes not laugh yes yes a thousand percent the good thing about stand-up though is like you say you make one mistake in the ring just maybe you put maybe you you know it's it's a difference in like an inch of where you put your foot or something yeah. like that and it's over if i'm doing like a set maybe it's 10 minutes half an hour whatever if i like make a mistake or a joke goes badly i still have that time. oh yeah you still have got 
turn it wrong. Like you're being knocked out or being un- put unconscious. In the no, <laughs> but but oh yeah, people have definitely like even I, I've been doing stand up for thirteen years and wow, I, I have done I have done the worst shows imaginable where people haven't laughed for twenty minutes straight and I'm. Are you serious? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember did doing that, did that. Did that not make you laugh? Because they weren't laughing. You're like, oh my god, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> so not at the start. At the start, I was just a very upset teenager. But now that I'm older, there's something when when it goes badly. Like unless people have paid to come and see me on tour, in which case if it goes badly, I feel guilty because you know they've they've, <laughs> come, they've come to see me. But if it's just part of like a comedy night with loads of acts on. I enjoy it because I know that my comedian mates backstage will be laughing. You know, yeah. I know, I know they're enjoying it, so I'm able to enjoy it. That's um, so funny, yeah. But I did a I did a corporate gig at Christmas about nine years ago for Iceland Supermarket in the holiday in Belfast. I'll never forget it. And um, <laughs> and I was to do twenty minutes, me and my mate, uh, at the end of their Christmas do. We got on stage. They kept it all in darkness with the strobe disco lights going, and they gave us a microphone. And nobody listened for well, no, I say that there was about 300 people there. One oh my woman, God. one woman turned her chair to look at us, and everyone else just she was a bit weirdo, but she kind of turned around to look at us, <laughs> and ev- everyone just turned her back and started because it was her Christmas do. So we were talking, having a laugh, so you, you were just standing there, like trying to you couldn't hear us. So uh, we, we ended up just totally focusing on one point of the room and just saying the stuff for 20 minutes. Oh my god, that's so bad. I mean, what. Yeah. A really bad one is okay. The worst one is when it's just all right. I don't know why. I don't know how to describe that. But when it's just like polite laughter, there's something in that where you're like, <laughs> it's not it's not bad enough to be really enjoyable. I I, I don't know. Oh my but, God. It's not like you can be like, uh, can I have your attention, please? I'm trying to be funny on stage. You have no, because like, when have I to want to watch it. <laughs> no, who's going to take me? Like, I look like a student teacher. So whenever I try and get out, I'm like, guys, could we just listen up for a second? Everybody's like, me, fuck <laughs> off. No, you know, never. You can't. If you lose them, you can't bring them back. That's the danger. Oh, like if the second they're awful. gone, they're they're never ever. I'm like to... sweating thinking about that. Like I would. Yeah. Die off that was have nice. your have your nerves changed over time? Your your first fight compared to like I, I want to talk to you about the Bellator fight in in Dublin. But how, do, what, what were the nerves like for your first fight? You talked about Neil Hall compared to that monster fight that you just had. So at the at the Ulster Hall, I was like, right, where's the fire exit? Like, I need to not, I need to get out of here. I'm not doing this. Like, I was the most terrifying. Like, it felt like somebody had a hand on my throat. I was like, I can't even describe how nervous I was. And to be honest, that that feeling is like still there because I I want to win so badly, and I put so much in there, and I sacrificed so much. And I, so, so my coach is actually, um, like, I get really bad nerves. And the, the last of my coach, Owen, he's, um, he's part of SBG in Dublin, that's where I train. And I, I, he, was, he said to me after the fight, like, Leah, you're still, like, competing at 10% of what you can do because I know how good you are. You need to, like, have, believe in yourself. And I always find it really hard, even though I know I'm going to win, but to really believe in my skill set and to just go out and, shoot, and be, like, free and know what I can do. And... Um, the last one, yeah, I was. It was a totally different thing because I was up from six a.m. Normally, the, the day before you, the fight, you can't sleep at all because you just your body is just like oh, your body just doesn't let you sleep. You're so exhausted. But I was the last fight of the night on, so it was like half eleven. So I was like sitting in my room all day, and I, like I have the, the funniest friends. Like they're so laugh out loud funny. Like two girls from Liverpool over, my friends over here. We were like the banter's always really good. Yeah. But it was like every hour felt like six hours and it was and I didn't get was, wasn't leaving to the arena till nine and then when I arrived at the arena like all the, the guys I know all my people I trained with like the other fighters were like some of them were like bloodied some had won some had, had lost you know you go in and there's just backstage there's so much different emotion yeah. and then it felt like I was in, in that warm-up room for like five hours and then you're you're, you're warming up and you're cooling down and you feel sick and then you you're excited and you're like I'm like I could go and embarrass myself like it's just like a roller coaster of emotion and it's just like the, the most heightened emotion every emotion is like heightened it was just crazy but I remember I remember saying to Owen like because he does Connor's um corner and I was like does, does Connor get nervous like and he Owen was like to me this isn't the fight in Belgium and he was like I he, he's like genuine he's the only person I've ever done the corner that doesn't doesn't ever seem nervous doesn't sh- like he's so confident and like I think that shows in his performance when he goes out and he's so confident I think that but it just like takes experience as well doesn't it just for your nerves and 
dealing with depression and dealing with that type of magnitude of events. Yeah, so hopefully I'll not be as bad for the next one. I think I'd only I'd only get worried if I if I didn't have any nerves. Like he, he, he yeah, maybe a, a different beast. But like I I would I would really worry if I if I didn't feel nerves. I'd I'd think God I'm not taking this seriously or it doesn't it doesn't mean yeah to me. I think it's definitely good to have, but you can like control them in a better way. Like I used to sh- for the first couple of years of stand up, I would my hand would shake in the microphone. So I would always keep, yeah. keep, like, keep moving around. Otherwise people would just see my, 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 no, yeah. my wee hand shaking. But the, the <laughs> so the Bellator fight in Dublin, um, you, that was uh, sort of like a, a, a great opportunity because you weren't originally supposed to headline. You were on the card, um, but then circumstances changed and you, you headlined the fight. The, yeah. The, whenever you get that, Whenever you get that call of like, okay, you're headlining now, um, did anything yeah. preparation wise, or is it just like, okay, try not to think about it? Um, it was it was quite hard because I had like so normally like the main event like James would do like all the media and things like and he has he has, has like twelve weeks out and you know I had like twelve weeks worth of, of media to do in four weeks on top of cutting weight on top of like like I travel six hours a day to train I have like a business I run I have got I coach as well I have my daughter I to get her to school I have to train two three times a day and then it's like on top of all that media like I actually nearly had a nervous breakdown and the like what when I'm in that situation I am like all state like I will I can achieve I know I can achieve anything I can handle it all but after that fight I was like even like the week after I was like I couldn't sleep for like a week I was like that was the most intense crazy like experience of my life and um, I hope my battery doesn't die. Uh, um, but what was what was your question again? I can't remember. No, same. Uh, no, it was it was whenever <laughs> you whenever you suddenly find out that you're you're the main event. Oh yeah. Does everything training. change? And like you say, like the press, like God doing a press tour in itself is 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 probably fe- probably feels like you've gone through a camp if you were only doing the press, just because yeah. you, you've just got to constantly like keep you know keep yourself entertained by like we talked about earlier not mentioning the same things all the time and and also trying to like yeah trying to like sell the fight so, so like that was I got so bad with the media because obviously I have to try I have, from the start of my career I've always made such an effort with the media because MMA isn't like tennis or hockey you have to really sell it and get people interested and make them understand how I guess the toughest sport in the world and like I've always made having had a good relationship with like the media up here but whenever they were contacting me directly instead of the Bellator, Bellator PR team, I was like, oh my goodness, because they were trying to like laze and make it all normal. So what I used to do, I was getting up in the morning, leaving Isabella school and doing two hours of media on the way, on, on the phone, like hands-free, obviously, on the way to training and like, ha- like being exhausted by the time I got to training, training and then coming back up and like, it was just non-stop intense. And then you're like, set, you're like doing ticket sales, like, People are like, "Will you meet me down the Norma Road at three o'clock?" And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. "No." <laughs> how many? How many people send you this on on fight day and fight night? Uh, what what time? Uh, what times are kicking off at there? Um, oh my god! What time should? What time? Like, because like, I'm looking people... to get a couple of beers, so should I go at about eight and do that? Uh, I mean, <laughs> like you have no idea. Like that that, that last one, especially like you know, my best friend took my phone because I kept being like, "Google it." go and look on the Bellator website. Are you actually asking me this yeah. today? Like, yeah. don't ask me anything ever. Don't speak to me. <laughs> yeah, people message you be like, where are my nearest toilets going to be if I'm in block N? And you're like, hey. <laughs> no, but like, they the genuinely were saying, where is block N? Where yeah. is, is that? Could you send me a screenshot of, of the arena? <laughs> like, are you being serious? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think people just don't understand what is going through you no. know, on 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 like the day of a fight. So, do I mean, what's great? I feel like what's great about you know you jumping onto the onto the main event uh, of that was I didn't see any like negative press around that. I didn't see anyone saying, um, "Oh, it's going to be a female main event." It was just like, you know, it it it, 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 it didn't matter to anyone. It, that that must have been nice to see that, unless I totally missed. A massive negative reaction to that in which case no so i so obviously i was expecting more negativity because there were so many more males on the card that had more experience and maybe a higher pedigree or, or higher up their divisions than i was and i was expecting loads loads of backlash about that but everybody kind of just took to the, the thing that it was like making history because it was the first female like type or headline and in, in europe and the first female to 
headline Bellator that wasn't the title fight. Do you know, but I was ready. I had my claws out. I was like, somebody say something. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like in that mood. I was just bad form. I was like on my Twitter. <laughs> Next time that happens, let me know. I'll put okay, some sort cool. of like sexist comment in, we'll and then back and forth, yeah. we'll have a back and forth, and then I'll stick a link for uh, for my next gig for tickets on. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll work for both Perfect. of us. Uh, did you yeah. notice after after the Bellator fight and uh, like the great thing is like you you won you won that fight. I'd say there's a big difference. Thank God. In, I'd say there's a big difference in headlining the main event and and headlining and winning the main event. Did yeah the next day after that did you did you notice things were a bit different? Is it, it what? Were you were you like oh this is this has made a big impact and how how did you notice that? Um, I don't know. Not me. I was like we were like all sitting for breakfast with my family and friends and like having a crack. Like not like to be honest, not really. Like I noticed it more so obviously in like social media and like people people actually a lot of people up here said oh what's your fight like do you know MMA isn't. I sometimes feel like I have to educate people about MMA and it's like it's a lot harder to get sponsors in MMA because people don't understand it or they don't. Whereas I feel like there's been a lot more appreciation for MMA as itself, do you know? And I feel like in MMA, women are qu- treated a wee bit more equally than in other sports and they're respected because I think people understand how hard it actually is. But um, I was actually due to fight in Wembley on the 16th of May, like a massive Wembley card and... That that was kind of I was like looking forward to that the next step, but obviously that's not happening now. <laughs> See your um if you're don't worry if your battery's down or whatever we'll 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 wrap this up in a second. But um I can put my my phone in charge though. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Don't worry. I was gonna it's say just what, people people are messaging me. Sorry, I, I'm not looking at my battery. What? Yeah, the family oh, yes. that the family that commentator being like, hey, where would you say? <laughs> this isn't live, is it? Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> And it's massive in Belgium. It's so massive in Belgium. But what's what's like? Do you know what's what's standing in your way? If you if 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 you want to just keep moving up, keep going to the top, do you know like okay, there's like five fighters in my way. Like, can can you see that sort of path, or is it like fight by fight, just see what happens? Um, I have a really good relationship with the promoters, with the matchmakers, and you know, I know they're they are keen to build me and like. They want me to six for bells or just because I I don't know. And I there's like we have Chris Cyborg, I don't know if you know her. She's the, the oh, yeah, champion yeah, yeah. Of, uh, of she's a champion of my division and obviously that's like she's the best female fighter in the world. I used to I actually watched her before I even started MMA. So the caliber of females in my division and Bellator is the, the hardest featherweight division in the world. So if you and like guys so in see in two big ones is UFC and Bellator, they're like competitors. Yeah. UFC don't have a featherweight division, but Bellator do. So I'm I'm with Bellator, and the UFC have flyweight and bantamweight. We have the other two. So there's only two female weight divisions in both of the promotions, where there's like ten or fifteen in the guys. Do you right. know, with yeah. hundreds of guys fighters, if you know what I mean. So the, the talent pool is quite small in females, but you're taking like massive, massive steps up every time you want to get better, and every time you want to fight, and every time you want to get closer to the title fight. So I know. I just signed a new sex fight day with Bellator. I know my, my future will probably be that with them. And obviously, one like down the line, I want to be a world professional world champion as an amateur world champion. That's my goal. Uh, at the minute, yeah, I'm just taking fight by fight. And like I was saying, like I have to like level up big time in between every fight. Like I've always like kind of thrown myself in at the like, massive deep end, like like baptism of fire, my professional debut. Like anything I do, it's like I nearly do it before I'm on paper ready to ever do it so it's nice yeah. now to take a step back and look at my training and relax and actually just try and get better rather than having like pressure on your shoulders of a massive fight coming up um say say they were like listen do you want to fight cyborg here it's gonna be madison square garden whatever and it's in two <laughs> weeks time would you take it um abs- yeah i would because i'm a psycho but oh my god i can say i hope she retires soon do you reckon you okay, she's so fighting like well, at least, at least, at least, it's not what you wish for the ref. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's a few steps yeah. down, so that's a lot better. But like, would you, would you back yourself? Would you be like, yeah, I I could go win this. I could go. 
so my whole thing for my I was amateur and like I always think no matter what experience you have or no matter what experience your opponent has there's you can always find a way to win like you can always like that's my belief because say I'm fighting a better striker or I'm fighting a better somebody has way more fights I'm always like no there, there's a way I can win and I've kind of proven that my whole whole career fighting people with more experience or more fights or people who should have beat me I always think no I you can always find a way to win I think that's a good like mentality to have yeah um my final question is what's the what's the dream i know i know you, there's bellator there's ufc um or maybe your dream is nothing to do with fighting at all but what do 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 you have one one ambition or like one thing that like you would absolutely love to love to do for me it's a venue i'd like to play but do you have like what venue is it um radio city music hall in new york oh it's, wow it's the one so so Bellator do um, Madison Square Garden, and I'm like to the guys, next time you're doing MSG, you better put me on it. You better put me on. like that's like my dream. I like I'd fight there for free in Madison Square Garden. This is like yeah. the mecca of martial arts. But no, my my dream and my goal is to be um, a professional world champion. Yeah, um, you know, you always hear people talk about like the garden. Like that's what I want to do. The garden. I mean, I, I'd be happy yeah. enough just. To, I'd be happy enough just to do botanic gardens. If, if I'm honest, <laughs> I, I I'd be delighted if I could, if if I could do that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I think you. What I'm noticing is you you are getting that like that local following of like one of our own kind of thing that the card frampton has that uh that that other other fighters have had and that must be really special as well because i feel like from from how i've been to like quite a few frampton fights and some of mcconlin's fights and it always feels like when the when the crowd are really there to support you that that, that must give you like a, a, an extra boost and uh yeah i think that's yeah that's, nice. that's definitely happening yeah, no, I like people always say like who do you look up to? And I always look up to all the Belfast boys, like Mick and Card, you know, like, they've made massive opportunities and we're all from like small places in Belfast and maybe these to become world class fighters. And I think it's it's so it's, it's nice to see them because I know they're great people as well as great fighters, you know, and it's exciting that we're all from Belfast and there's some of the best fighters in the world from here. Yep. All right. Well, Leah, thanks very much for uh, for chatting to me. Really, really appreciate it. And um, no problem. I didn't know you were from Sainfield. Just want to say, Jackson's at Sainfield, decent shop. A lot of a lot <laughs> of here. Whatever you need, they have it. I mean, they're not sponsoring the podcast, but um, I've been there before <laughs> and I and I enjoyed it. And sometimes I've, I've been to the Vivo in Sainfield a couple of times. Good spot. It's great shop, isn't it? Good, Good spot. spot. Yeah, I've been there a few times recently because of this, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my local. Um, okay, all right. Well, thanks very much for chatting to me, and um, see you soon. No worries. Okay, sure. bye. Bye. There we have it, Sippers, the Liam McCord episode of the Tea With Me podcast. I think it's pretty clear from that that um, Leah's career is just going to go up and up. And um, I think the the people from here are, are just going to support her more and more. And I mentioned it to her on the podcast, but with the whole Carl Frampton thing, the Michael Conlon thing, I really think that's going to happen for uh, for Leah. She's a, she's a real good ambassador for not just her sport, but for this wee place we call home. Um, so cheers to her for doing the episode I, I, I enjoyed that obviously you'll see that around fighters I kind of changed the way I talk a wee bit and I'm like you know talking about like the jab and talking about weight divisions and all that kind of thing I don't know what I'm talking about I really don't but I, I enjoy the sport and uh, and Leah was a lot of fun to chat to so um, yeah go follow her on social media all that kind of thing um, you can just you can just I guess get a get a look behind the inner workings of uh of somebody from here that is uh, that is a female professional um, fighter, and I, I find that I find that really interesting. I think she's got a real interesting story. We're going to keep these podcasts rolling. The wed the Wednesday and Friday episodes that are like available to everyone, and the Patreon episodes on a Monday. patreoncom slash tea with me podcasts. I really really want to plug the TV show one more time. BBC One tonight, which is Friday, if you've got the episode on the day it came out previously with Shane Todd 10.45 BBC One please check that out it's a TV show I shot last year it was on last year 19 people watched it it'd be really cool if more people watched it this time I'm really really proud of it I think it's a funny show I think you'll enjoy it it's me looking back through archive footage I'm in front of a live audience and it's not one of those ones like it's not like what what people call a shiny studio floor show where it's like canned laughter or there's like a sign saying like laugh or applause. It's it's a wee bit more gritty, 
we did it in the Accidental Theatre in Belfast, which is a great space, and it was um, it was sort of like it had an indie feel to it because we did it was a pilot. It was what's called a televised pilot, so they film something, they they don't commit to a series, they put it on TV and they see what the reaction is, and frustratingly, the reaction we got to it was overwhelmingly positive, but the viewing figures just didn't really match it, and I guess they judge what they make for TV based on how many people are going to watch it, which which I get. Um, so I would love it if more people watched it this time. So it's BBC One, 10.45 tonight. Previously with Shane Todd, if you can if you can check that out. Sippers, thank you very much for listening or watching the podcast. I really, really appreciate it, and I'll see you next time. Sip, sip.